Well, good morning. K4 and 5 to dismiss the Children's Church. It is a privilege to be able to preach for the next five Sundays here at Evangel. If you're visiting, I am Benny Collins, and I'm an associate pastor over youth and missions and outreach, and I drive the bus for senior adult events and whatever else I'm told to do. Uh, but it's a privilege to, um, to preach for Jeff as he's away on his sabbatical uh, for the next five Sundays. And so to do that, we're going to go through a series in the book of Acts. The book of Acts is a powerful book. And I encourage you over the next five weeks to perhaps take a chapter a day and read through the book of Acts. Uh, but as we do, let me mention to you that, that Acts forms a perfect counterpart in contrast to the Gospels. Uh, Luke writes his Gospel and also the, the book of Acts. In the Gospels, the Son of Man offered his life. In Acts, the Son of God offers his power. In the Gospels, we see the original seeds of Christianity. In Acts, we see the continual growth of the church. Uh, the Gospels tell us of Christ crucified and risen. Acts speaks of Christ ascended and exalted. The Gospels model the Christian life as lived by the perfect man, Jesus. Acts models it as lived by imperfect men. Acts is a very powerful book, and I hope that the Lord will do great work as we speak upon it the next five Sundays. If you would, turn with me to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And we're going to speak about that question, are you empowered by the Spirit of God? Acts chapter 1, verse 8. If you would stand with me as we read God's holy word together. Let me just begin at verse 7. He said to them, It is not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. Let's pray together this morning. Lord Jesus, would you speak to us this morning? Father, would your presence be here? As we read from your word. And Father, would you change us to become more like yourself? Father, we desire to hear a word from you. And so would you speak to us? And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So Acts chapter 1 8 is known as the uh, as, as a key verse in the book of Acts, but as we think about the power of the Holy Spirit, let me share this story with you this morning. Let's say that you go to Sears. You go and you're looking for a refrigerator. And you go to the appliance section, you see the one that you want. It is top of the line. We're talking $10,000. This is a serious refrigerator. You open the doors and the trays slot out automatically. This refrigerator has amazing features. You decide to buy it. They're going to deliver it in a few hours, so you go home to be there for the delivery. But on your way home... You stop by the supermarket, and you load up because you want to fill the refrigerator up with your goods and items. So they pull up, and they bring your refrigerator in, in and put it in place. So you load it down with all of the goodies that you've picked up from the store, and you feel really good about what you have now in your home. When you wake up the next day and go to the refrigerator for breakfast, you discover something that is very heart-wrenching. You discover that the milk has soured. The ice cream has run all over the floor. And the vegetables are beginning to change colors. It becomes evident to you that this thing does not work. And all this investment was for naught. And you are angry. So what do you do? You pick up the telephone and you call Sears to give them a piece of your Christian mind. So you get the associate on the phone you say who sold you the refrigerator and you say, sir, I bought this refrigerator for $10,000 and it does not work. The associate apologizes to you and says, listen, do me a favor. Go put your ear to the bottom of the refrigerator and see if you hear the low hum of the motor. You say, hold the line. So you go, you put your ear there, but nothing. He says, pull the freezer door and see if the light comes on. You say, hold the line. You go and you open it, and nothing. And he says, there's a cord at the back of your refrigerator. Would you tell me whether it has been plugged in? 
So you come back to the phone and you say, I've looked and I saw the cord and it is not plugged in. But for $10,000, it should have to be. It should just work on general principle. The associate then explains to you that this expensive brand new refrigerator has all the manufacturer specifications to do and to be all that it was designed to do and be, but not without power. It's got parts, but the parts can't work without power. Just having the parts as expensive and precious as they are won't allow the parts to do what the parts were designed to do unless it's connected to power. This morning as we journey through the book of Acts, I want us to think about power and the power that Jesus promises would be inside of us. In Acts chapter 1-8, we learn about this promise of power. Luke begins as he pens the book of Acts, and we see the disciples are in a state of waiting after the resurrection of Jesus. The disciples were told not to leave Jerusalem, but wait for what the Father had promised. But what did they need to wait for as we begin the book of Acts? They had been taught by Jesus, they had followed Jesus, they had loved Jesus, and yet as he is risen, they are told to simply wait. It would seem as if they would be able to carry on the faith, but they wait. And they wait because Jesus will not leave them on their own. He knew that they could never preach and teach and live out this Christian faith without him. And so as, as Luke finishes his gospel in the chapter, of verse, chapter 24, verse 49, he writes, Wait, but you are to stay in the city of Jerusalem until you are clothed with power from on high. And what great news for the early disciples, and what great news for us, that Jesus promises to clothe us with power that is on high. And so we're going to take a look at that this morning, and take a look at his promise to empower. A promise to empower. But you will receive power. As the disciples wait, I can imagine the conversations in their, as, in, as they're in Jerusalem about 40 days after the resurrection as they wait for this power that is to come. But what I want us to think about this morning is that when Jesus tells them, but you will receive power, he tells them a few things. And one is this, you are not alone. I have died and I have risen again, but wait, for you are not alone. At the end of the Gospels, we can imagine the heartache, the heartbreak, the confusion of the disciples. First, Jesus' arrest, and then Peter's denials. The disciples must have struggled with the loss of Christ and all that that meant. But Acts 1.8, Jesus reminds the disciples of one of his great promises that affects us greatly. Even though Jesus would return to heaven, the Holy Spirit would come and would clothe his children. He would not leave them alone. He would not leave them alone in, the, in a defenseless world. He would not abandon his children to fight the good fight alone. He would send the gift of the Holy Spirit. We don't always talk a lot about the Holy Spirit. But what a gift the Holy Spirit is. For we are not alone. At times we may feel defeated. You may feel defeated this morning. In this lost and fallen world that we live in. At times our prayers may seem ineffective. At times, our time in God's Word may seem dry. Sometimes we feel like we have been left all alone to fight this life. But I want us to know this morning, as we journey through the book of Acts, we're going to see that you have not been abandoned. And you have not been left to fight this Christian life alone. The Holy Spirit indwells in every, every believer. And he gives us boldness, wisdom, courage, and comfort to live a faithful, victorious life that glorifies our Father in heaven. But that's not all. We're also not left alone, but as believers, we are more than adequate to live this life that we are called to live. Not only are you not alone, but you are more than adequate to live out the dynamic faith that is taught by Jesus. How do we know this? As you read the book of Acts, we, re we read much about Peter. So I'll speak about Peter for just a moment. We certainly remember Peter as a beloved, faithful disciple of Jesus. He pledged his allegiance to Jesus, uh, but we know that before Jesus' death, 
that he denied Jesus three times. And he left from there heartbroken. As he, did, as he denied Jesus, you know, you're, you're wondering as you read the book of Luke, what will happen to Peter? Uh, would he spend the rest of his life in regret and sorrow? And we know that is not what happened. We read in John's Gospel, we see Jesus forgive and restore Peter. And in the book of Acts, we read of the many ways that he was empowered as a mighty disciple of Jesus through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Peter stands and proclaims in Acts chapter 2 the mighty greatness of the gospel and proclaims a powerful sermon declaring the death and resurrection of Jesus. In the book of Acts, he's gone from a man full of fear to a man full of faith. Peter's now clothed with what Luke called the clothes of Jesus. He called the clo clothing with the power of the Holy Spirit. I imagine that Peter was devastated after he denied Jesus, if you think for a moment. In Mark 14, 72, it says, Immediately a, a rooster crowed a second time, and Peter remembered how Jesus had made the remark to him, Before a rooster, rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And then the scripture says he began to weep. I think about Peter. He's a bold man, loved Christ, and yet when times got hard, denied him. And he walked away, and we see him weeping in the end of book, in, in, at the end of the book of Luke. But when we pick up an axe, the Holy Spirit has come, and he has been forgiven, he's been set free, and suddenly Peter is a mighty man of faith. And we read in Acts 2.41... As a, result of one of, as a result of Peter's sermon, we read, So then those who had received his word, Peter's sermon, were baptized. And that day there were added about 3,000 souls. Peter has gone from weeping to a soul winner. But us this morning, what about us? Let's turn the table from Peter to us in this room. It is, it is exciting. And it is humbling to know that the Holy Spirit lives in us. There are times that you may feel that you have nothing to offer because you have messed up like Peter did. And your spiritual gifts, they seem more like spiritual chores. You don't really want to have anything to do with them. But I want you to know this morning that the gift of the Holy Spirit that lives in you equips you to be more than adequate to live this Christian life. For you have the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, when we think about our Christian walk, and maybe we think about topics like missions or evangelism or living our lives as witnesses of the gospel can seem intimidating, can seem scary and overwhelming. But the great truth is that we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us that equips us to live this life. For we have not been left alone. And we are more than capable through the Holy Spirit to live this life that we are called to live. But only do we have a promise to empower but we also have a promise to equip. The Lord promises that he will equip us for this life that we're to live. Verse 8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. As the disciples wait in Jerusalem, the Lord promises the Holy Spirit to come upon them. The power that they were to receive was divine power. The word is dynamis. It's the same word used of Jesus' miracles in the gospel. They and we need spiritual power, spiritual power that Jesus promises to give. So when we think about this promise to equip, and as we're equipped, we become witnesses. Throughout the book of Acts, what do we see in the disciples in the early church that allow them to be witnesses? We see at least two things. One is that we, receive, we, we see that the early church received power to worship. And as they worshipped, they became witnesses. But they received power to worship. As the Holy Spirit comes on the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, go on and read it. As the, as the Holy Spirit comes, we see a dramatic scene unfold in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. The Holy Spirit comes, and immediately we see amazing, heartfelt worship. Those looking on are amazed as the disciples were speaking in tongues, but specifically as they were speaking the mighty acts of God. The, follow, the followers of Christ in chapter 2 are devoting themselves to the word and to prayer. In Acts 4.31, if you want to read that with me, we see an amazing occurrence as the disciples are praying. In Acts chapter 4, verse 31, And when they prayed, 
the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in the word of God with boldness. The place they are meeting is shaken. The idea is simply this. The truth is the Holy Spirit gives us the power to truly worship our God. Before we go about his business, before we go about being the witness we'll talk about in a moment, we first recall the worship. We think of it maybe as like a dimmer switch. In many of our homes, we have dimmer switches. The dimmer switch is designed to progressively turn up the lights. The Holy Spirit is your dimmer. He turns up the lights so that you can see things you couldn't see before. As we are in tune with Him, we find ourselves in heartfelt daily worship. As we are open and listening, the Holy Spirit gives us the spiritual power for the spiritual work ahead of us. The disciples were expectantly waiting in Jerusalem for what the Father would bring, what this gift would be. And the Holy Spirit showed up and rocked their world, as we read in Acts chapter 2. As the Holy Spirit resides in us, we are drawn to worship for our God is worthy. Read Acts chapter 2 and take time to think about, to, med to meditate on, to imagine what it must have been like when the Holy Spirit came down on, upon that early church. The worship is incredible. The, exciting, the excitement is contagious. It says in Acts 2 that the, those who were looking on, they were amazed at what was going on. But that Holy Spirit lives inside of us. And we too can be drawn to that dynamic worship as we become witnesses, and as we receive that power from above. But as we, are, as we receive power to worship, we also receive power to work. As the disciples broke out into powerful worship, they also gave their attention and devotion to kingdom work, for they're called to be witnesses. For no person who experiences powerful worship then decides to spend their time as a spiritual couch potato. They just don't. Those who truly worship, they go to work and they're about the kingdom. Followers of Christ will receive great power to do the work that he has called them to do. Those whom the Lord calls into his service, he qualifies, he equips for the work. And as we do this work, we are completely dependent upon the Lord and the work of the Holy Spirit. This ministry of the Holy Spirit we speak about, it's not a luxury, it's a necessity. It's something we have to have inside of us. We work under the motivation, the empowerment, and the leadership of the Holy Spirit. We just don't always think of it in this way. We don't always think about the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. We, we, we know the Lord has called us to, to go to church, to sing songs, to be a body, to fellowship, to do His work. But we don't always think about how the Holy Spirit lives inside of me and the power that lives inside of me. And I think about it in a very small way like this. Thursday evening, I lose my iPhone at home. The last memory of it is on the kitchen countertop plugged in charging, but it's not there anymore. And I become frustrated because it's gone. And so I begin to ask my kids, where's my iPhone? They have no clue. I accuse Kylie because she takes my iPhone and she doesn't have it. And so Brianna and myself, we go to look for my phone and I cannot find it anywhere. We're looking at her couch cushions, countertops, den, kitchen. Kim's on her phone, so I can't get her to call it yet. Looking at it, you've done this before yourself. So Kim is off the phone and said, please call my phone so I can find it. Because I'm accusing Kylie, Brianna, just ever, you know. And so she finally calls it. And we anxiously go to find it. And as it, as it rings, I suddenly discover it's in my pocket. Right? <laughs> You've done this before. You've done that before. But what's the point? What's the point? The Holy Spirit resides in us. The power of the Spirit resides in us. For the gift of the Holy Spirit is given to believers. And yet there are times that we don't realize it. We don't think about it. We go about our daily business and we don't think of the realities of who we are in Christ. But we receive the power to worship and the power to work. You know, think about this when we think about the work, the work we've been called to. What's the difference between a rowboat and a speedboat? Think for a moment. What's the difference in a rowboat and a speedboat? A rowboat requires human effort. A speedboat moves based on another power source. 
a rowboat might represent this, my determination to get there. Oftentimes in my spiritual life, I think I'm a rowboat. I'm just going to make it happen, pull up my bootstraps. I'm going to do my best to get there, but I need to get done. But you're not called to be a rowboat. You're called to ride in the speedboat. A speedboat represents the Christian who relies on the power of the Holy Spirit to propel him forward in his Christian life and to get him where he needs to go. Jesus didn't leave the disciples to do the work alone. They're sitting here in Acts chapter 1 receiving this great power called the Holy Spirit to work in them. And that great power empowers them, it equips them, but it also has a purpose to impact eternity. The Lord is going to use these men, these women, this early church to impact his world for eternity. They get to share in this mission, and so do we this morning. You have a mission. The verse ends with, You shall be my witnesses in both Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. You have a mission. You shall be my witnesses. Witness is a key word in the book of Acts. If you go home and read the 28 chapters of the book of Acts, you'll count the word witness at least 39 times used as either a verb or a noun. In the original Greek language, the word for witness is also the same word for martyr, which is very interesting. Jesus has called us to be radical in our witness. We are to be loyal at no, at no matter the cost. To be a witness for Jesus in our home, neighborhood, workplace, and city can be a difficult task. But the whole reason we are given the power of the Holy Spirit is so we can be this witness. So we can be a martyr for Jesus. And we can be completely sold out. We've been called for a great purpose that impacts eternity itself. We're called to be a witness in, at our home in Jerusalem. We're to be a witness to our distant neighbors, perhaps in Judea. We're called to be a witness even in the places that are difficult and with people that we may not like, like maybe in Samaria. And we're called to go out to the entire remotest areas of the earth. Luke emphasizes that disciples of Jesus are on a mission, and that mission includes you and it includes me. In reality, Acts chapter 1-8, as it is a primary sort of key verse in the book of Acts, it also provides an outline for the book of Acts. Acts 1 through 7 speaks of our witness in Jerusalem. Acts chapters 8 through 12 represents our witness in Judea and Samaria. And then chapters 13 through 28 speak to our witness at the very ends of the earth. So we have a mission. We also have a ministry. We all have a ministry. The Lord has empowered you with to get the Holy Spirit for you to serve in the ministry that you're a part of. We all have a ministry to be witnesses. Ministry is not just for those with fancy Bible degrees, not just for those who stand in pulpits. We're all ministers and representatives of Jesus in our daily lives. The Spirit of God is seen in, in many different gifts, uh, as, as if you know the passage in the book of Romans. If you were to look in Romans chapter 12, and you were to read verses 6 through 8, Paul writes, since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy, according to, to the pro proportion of his faith. If service, in his serving. Or he who teaches, in his teaching. He who exhorts, in his exhortation. He who gives, with liberality. He who leads, with diligence. He who shows mercy, with cheerfulness. Paul reminds us, whether you teach, if you lead, if you give, if you show mercy... Whatever you might do, you have a ministry, and you have a purpose. What is your ministry? Maybe it's your children. Maybe it's your family, your workplace. Maybe it's a parachurch ministry like a Save Life or a Discovery Club. Or maybe it's um, wherever you have your hobbies. But we are all called to have a ministry. If you're breathing this morning, if you're breathing, you have a ministry. And we are called by the power of the Holy Spirit to exercise our gifts for that ministry. But reality, the American church, we struggle with this. You know, we, we, we struggle with really understanding the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. And we quench it. And we forget how we can be used. Some, in, in some manner, as this story I'll share. There was a lady who lived out in the boondocks. Now, if you don't know what the boondocks is, you can Google it later. I lived in the boondocks growing up in Forest Home, Alabama, where, you're, uh, where what you do is you, you rock on rocking chairs and you peel butter beans and peas. 
Uh, but there's a lady that lived out in the boondocks. She did not have electricity, but she wanted it. So she called the electric company, and they made arrangements so that a line could be gotten out to her so she could have electricity. After delivering electricity to her home for about six months, someone at the company noticed that only one unit of electricity had been used. So the serviceman was sent out to check and make sure there was no problem. He rang her doorbell, and when she answered, he asked, Hello, miss, are you using your electricity? She said, Why, yes, I am. Well, may I ask what you're using it for? Well, when it gets dark, I turn it on long enough for me to light my kerosene lamp. So the woman didn't understand the power she had. She had all of this power that she could keep things well lit all night long, but she was settling for a kerosene existence. Many of us are settling for taking the great power that God has given us only to light our own human efforts, and we're not maximizing the power of his presence. As we journey through the book of Acts, I want us to really think about the reality of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us and the power that we are given through the gift of Acts 1-8. We're all called and we're all capable because of the power that lives within us. Let me pray this morning. Father, we're so thankful that, Lord, you did not leave us alone. But, Lord, as you empower us, you allow us to be more than capable and able to live this life that you've called us to. Lord, you equip us for a grand design. Lord, you allow us to be witnesses of your death and your resurrection. And you allow us to go out and to impact eternity. So, Father, for each of us, as we journey through the book of Acts, Lord, would you help us to see the calling you've called us to, and we, would we with great boldness and courage live the ministries that you've given us. And so we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Stand with me this morning as we have the benediction. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.